stadium. Katrina Webb. Jill gold medalist at Atlanta. moment in my life that I'll never forget. Carrying the torch into the stadium for the opening ceremony of the Sydney 2000 Paralympic Games. 110,000 people in the stadium and 2.2 billion viewers worldwide. Now this is also a moment in my life that I never had in my goals or my plans to be chosen as one of four athletes from around the world to speak at the closing ceremony of the International Year of Sport and Physical Education for the United Nations in New York. Now, you may be looking at this photo, as I've said, there's four athletes in it, and trying to work out who the other athletes may be. And some of you may have spotted someone to my right in the photo. Can you see? Yeah, it's Roger Federer. And in fact, now I'm looking at it on the big screen, I think I've just realised something. I think maybe he was trying to check me out. (laughs) What do you think if you have a little bit of a closer look? (laughs) You see, life is unpredictable. When I see myself in these moments, I could never, ever imagine that anything like this could have happened to me, let alone plan for it in advance. But when I look back, what I've realised is when when I learnt to face my fears and live my authentic self and empower now, incredible opportunities have been presented to me. Being here today is one of those. So you may be wondering how you heard that I'm a Paralympian. And the reason why I'm a Paralympian is because I have a very mild case of cerebral palsy on my right side. And when I found out what I had was cerebral palsy, my parents started to receive phone calls from their friends. And their friends were saying, I'm really sorry to hear about Katrina. And I think they were sorry because I, didn't, I don't think they really understood what cerebral palsy was. Maybe they had this image of cerebral palsy being someone like Steady Eddie. Do you remember the Australian comedian and actor with cerebral palsy? But what most people are unaware of is that there are many different types and severities of cerebral palsy. And every 15 hours in Australia, a baby is born with it. So what actually is cerebral palsy? It is considered a neurological disorder caused by a brain injury or malformation that occurs while a child's brain is under development. So it is not, um, well it is permanent, it is incurable, it's not progressive, but it's okay, you can't catch it. (laughs) So here's an image of my brain. And if you look at my pictures a little bit closer, you can see that there is a little bit of white area or a bit of a white patch, which is the scar tissue. That's where my brain injury had occurred before I was born. And if you look at the picture, you can see that it's in my left hemisphere. And as we all know, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of your body. So that's where I actually feel the effects of my cerebral palsy on my right side. So the biggest thing that I can't do is I can move my right toes only just, yet I can't curl them over. Yet I can do it so easily on my left side. And I'm sure some of you are sitting there right now trying to just curl your toes over right and checking out whether you can actually do it. It's really easy for me to do, but I just cannot do it on my right side. Now, here's something you can do with me. I want you to place your hands out in front of you, palms up to the ceiling, and I want you to slowly turn them down and then up again. Okay. Now, I want you to speed it up as fast as you can go. Okay, go, 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 fast, fast, fast. Okay, can you see as I'm doing this, my right side probably by now is looking a little bit uncoordinated. It's hard to keep up. Now I'm going to stop, but keep going, keep going, because I always like to see if there's any new recruits somewhere, (laughs) somewhere in the room. (laughs) You see, my disability was diagnosed when I was three years of age, but I didn't actually know it was called cerebral palsy until I was 18. I always knew I had something wrong, but because you can't really see it, and because I didn't really understand what it was, 
I just found it easier just to hide. So my family were never able to tell anybody that I had something wrong with me, let alone the fact that I had to wear this little plaster to bed on my right leg to make sure my right calf didn't tighten up while I slept. And I had to wear this plaster for some time until I stopped growing, which I worked out was around 3,000 nights. Why didn't I want people to know? Why weren't my family allowed to tell anybody? Because I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be that person that was different at school. Because I can remember from a young age having thoughts that said to me, Katrina, you know, if people find out that you're different, they may not like you. They might tease you and you might not fit in. So it's probably easier just to try and hide so you can fit in just like everybody else. So that's exactly what I did. I worked hard. I worked hard physically and academically to feel like I could fit in just like everyone else. And it did pay off. I went from being a very good young netballer to making it to the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra in 1995 on a netball scholarship. As you can imagine, as a 17-year-old, this was really exciting. But this was the year that completely changed my life. Firstly, I developed a knee injury on my right side, a significant one, that put a dampener on my year. Now, it hurt, but it hurt emotionally for me, not so much physically. Once I then got back on the court, I started to not get picked for the team. And as you can imagine, as a young sportswoman, this was heartbreaking. But to top it all off, in that year, I found out that this weakness that I had on my right side was, in fact, called cerebral palsy. You know, it didn't change anything for me practically but it just put a label on something that I had. And but very quickly, the word got around the Institute of Sport that I was there. I was supposed to be on a non-disabled scholarship, yet I had a disability. So as you can imagine, the coaches of athletes with a disability got really excited to hear I was there. Wow, a new recruit. <laughs> so one day I was, uh, I remember just heading to training and this coach came up to me who's just really enthusiastic and passionate. And he walked up to me and I could feel his energy and I could see that he was rubbing his hands together. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, Katrina, we've found out you've got cerebral palsy. He was so excited and pumped up. It was like I'd won the lottery. <laughs> he said to me, in a year's time, if you get classified, which is a, a process that you go through, a physical process, to work out firstly whether you have enough of a disability to be eligible for the Paralympics. And then if you tick that box, you then get classified so you compete on a level playing field. So I would compete against girls just like me if I could get classified. Then he went on to say if I, could get quali if I could qualify in a Paralympic sport. Now, netball's not even in the Olympics, let alone the Paralympics, so it would have to be another sport, maybe like athletics. And he was an athletics coach, so he was saying to me, athletics would be a good sport. So get classified, qualify, one year's time, you could be at the Atlanta Paralympic Games. Now, do you think I was excited and pumped up like this coach was? No, in fact, I was frightened. Because when I heard him say that I could become a Paralympian, I knew that people would know that there was something wrong with me and I would no longer be fitting in. And I deeply, deeply hated that about myself. So 1995 was my introduction, introduction to sports psychology. I sat down with my psychologist and I wrote down a list of my fears or the negatives and a list of positives in this situation. You know, my list of negatives were exactly that, my list of fears. Will I be good enough? Will I fail? What will people think of me? Will they like me? Will I fit in? You know, have you ever heard those thoughts before? In fact, I hear them all the time still, particularly when I choose to step out of my comfort zone. But when I actually looked at my list of positives, I hadn't realised that this list was, was exactly what I was trying to achieve in my life. I could go to a Paralympic Games, I could represent my country, I could maybe be the best in the world at something, maybe win a medal, I could travel. But the thing that actually excited me on that list was maybe I could help some other people. You see, I remember asking myself this question at age 18, why am I so embarrassed about having a difference? Why do I hate it so much? Why am I spending so much time hiding this thing if anyone's ever hid anything before, there is a lot of energy that you need to use up to make sure people don't find out that you're different. For what? Why was I doing that? 
I thought to myself, if I become a Paralympic athlete, not only am I going to be able to learn to be the best athlete I can be, but I'm going to have to learn some tools to maybe accept this thing I don't like. And maybe what? Maybe I might even love it. And if I can learn to do that, then maybe I can help other people just like me. So I decided to go for it. I headed to my first Paralympic Games in 1996 in Atlanta. I was successful in being classified and qualifying in the sport of athletics. I competed in the 100, 200 and long jump and came back with two gold and a silver medal. And it was extraordinary because I got to compete on a level playing field for once in my life. But do you know what the best thing was? That I actually got to meet people just like me. You know, have you ever felt that relief to know that there are other people just like you out there? So after the Atlanta Games, Sydney were the next. And what an amazing opportunity to get to compete in Sydney. The first time the Games have ever been in our country and to get to compete in front of a home crowd, let alone have that amazing opportunity to bring the torch into the stadium. Now, I won two silver and a bronze at the Sydney Games for the 100, 400 and 200. It actually took me eight years of winning silver, silver, silver and a few more silvers to get back to a gold medal level again in the Athens 2004 Paralympic Games for the 400 metres. So what did I have to do differently to get back to that gold medal level? For me, it was actually learning about the power of my mind. I explored more about sports psychology. I had to learn how to focus and prepare my mind for competition. But one of the most incredible things I learned was that negative thoughts aren't wrong or weak. They're just a sign of a human mind. And that's, I had a choice to do something with those negative thoughts. I learned that I could turn them up or turn them down. I learned tools that were just like imagining that my thoughts were like a, my own radio show, where I could tune into the thoughts or programs that really worked for me, and the ones that were maybe unhelpful and unwanted, that I could tune out. I didn't have to fight them. I didn't have to debate them. I just learned processes to just let them be. And they were the tools that helped me to win gold. But ironically, they were exactly the same tools I needed to learn to accept my difference. For me, I learnt that it is wonderful to be different. I actually love the fact that I have cerebral palsy. I learnt to turn a weakness into my point of difference. And aren't we all looking for our point of difference? And when I was able to let that energy go and live my authentic self, I've been able to empower others. And a few years ago in Adelaide, it's where I'm from, I launched a program for young kids, um, for an organisation that look after young kids with a disability. And after my speech, this amazing woman came up to me and she was holding her, the hand of a young three-year-old boy. And as she got closer, I could see that she had tears rolling down her face. And immediately I thought, gee, what's happened? How can she have tears of sadness? But I didn't realise they were, in fact, tears of hope and joy. Because when she started to speak to me, she said to me, Katrina, it is absolutely fabulous to meet somebody who has exactly the same cerebral palsy as my three-year-old son. She said, I have spent so much time worrying about what's going to happen to him when he gets older. Will he fit in? Will he get teased? Will he be able to do what he wants to do in his life? But now I've met you and seen that you've been able to do that. I now have hope that he'll be able to do the same thing. Now I get goosebumps every time I share that story to know that I've been able to help empower others by learning to empower now. So let me ask you this question. Is there something that you could be holding back or that you're hiding just like I did? And if you could learn to face your weaknesses or your fears, learn some tools to empower your mind, then you too can empower now and that's where our gold is. Thank you.